Right, so I think um, we're going to get started. So thank you very much to everybody for coming. I'm quite excited uh, today to give you an insight of the state of production machine learning in 2018. Uh, this talk is going to be a high-level overview of the ecosystem and is going to tackle and, and dive into three key areas, uh, the ones that I personally am focusing the most. Um, so to tell you a bit uh, more about myself, uh, I am currently the chief scientist at the Institute for Ethical AI and Machine Learning and also engineering director at this open source, open core startup uh, called Seldon Technologies based in London. Um, to tell you a bit more about both of my roles, uh, with the Institute, I focus primarily on creating uh, standards uh, as well as open source frameworks that ensure uh, uh, people have the right tools and infrastructure uh, to align with all those ethical principles that are coming out uh, as well as industry standards. So it basically asks the question of what is the infrastructure required um, so that reality matches expectation. If there's a regulation like GDPR that demands the right to explainability, it's really questioning what does that mean from an infrastructure level and what would it be required to even enforce it. And then from the day-to-day, uh, uh, -day, so I lead uh, the machine learning engineering department at Selden. Uh, Selden is an open source machine learning orchestration library. So you would basically use Selden if you want to deploy models in Kubernetes and basically manage you know, hundreds or thousands of models in production. And some of the examples that I'm going to be diving on uh, are actually going to be using some of our open source tools. You can find the slides uh, as well as everything that we're using in that link on the top right corner. Uh, the link's going to be there, so uh, you know, don't rush to take, to take a picture. Um, so let's get started. In terms of small data science projects, and just data science projects in general, they tend to boil down into two different steps. The first one is model development. The second one is model serving. Um, in the first one, you know, the standard steps that you would go through is basically getting some data, you know, cleaning the data based on some knowledge, defining some features uh, to transform the data, uh, then selecting a set of models with hyperparameters. Uh, and then with your scoring metrics, you would then iterate many, many times until you're happy. Uh, and once you're happy with the results of, what, uh, of the model that you've built, you would want to persist this model. And then you would go to the next step, which is you serve it in production. That's when unseen data is going to go pass through the model. And you're going to get predictions and uh, inference on that new data. That is basically you know, a very big simplification. but uh, you know, we're going to be using this uh, uh, f throughout the talk. However, as your data science requirements grow, you know, we face new issues. You know, it's not just as simple as you keeping track of the features and, and, and the different uh, uh, algorithms that you use at, at every single stage. You know, you have an increasing complexity on the flow of your data, right? You perhaps had a few cron jobs running the models that you pushed in production, and now that you have quite a few you go into a uh, cron job hell, right? I mean, I don't know who uses that, you know, uh, uh, color palette for the terminal, but I guess um, each data scientist has their own uh, set of tools. You know, some uh, hard TensorFlow, you know, some uh, loves R, Spark, you know, you name it. Uh, 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 and, you know, good luck trying to take them away, not just because uh, they just really like them, but also because some are more useful for certain jobs than others. So you're going to see a lot of uh, different things that you're going to have to put in production. Serving models also becomes increasingly harder. So you actually have multiple different stages uh, 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 that have their own complexities in themselves. You know, building models, hyperparameter tuning, those in, in themselves become you know, one, one uh, big theme uh, on themselves. And then when stuff goes wrong, you know, it's actually hard to trace back, right? If something goes bad in production, you know, is it because of the data engineering uh, uh, piece or the data scientist or the software engineer, right? You always have like the, the, the Spider-Man, you know, pointing fingers. Um, so basically what we boil down from there is that as your technical functions grow, uh, so should your infrastructure. And this is what we refer to today as machine learning operations or just production machine learning concepts. 
Uh, in this case, you know, it is, it is that green layer that involves that uh, model and data versioning, orchestration, and, you know, really, it's not just, you know, those two things. Uh, and the reason why it's challenging is because we are now seeing an intersection of multiple uh, roles. This is basically software engineers, data scientists, and DevOps engineers, which are uh, condensing into this role of machine learning engineer. And, you know, the definition of this role in itself is, is quite complex because it does fall in expertise in those areas. And you see that when you look at a job description, right? You know, these this, this AI startups are hiring for this PhD with, you know, 10 years experience in software development, you know, uh, maybe three years McKinsey-style consulting experience uh, for a salary of an intern, right? I mean, that's, that's basically what you have a lot of the times. And, and you know, the reason why it is, it is challenging is because we're not seeing things like, you know, data science at scale. Uh, and you have the requirements for the, the things that you would normally follow uh, in, in, the, in the sort of like data science world to also apply in some of the, in, in certain extent, in the software engineering and DevOps world. And, you know, when I say it's challenging, it's because it actually breaks down into a lot of concepts. And we've actually broken down the ecosystem in uh, uh, an open source, awesome production uh, uh, machine learning list, which, you know, we would love for you guys to contribute. You know, if you see one of the tools that is missing, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the most extensive uh, uh, lists uh, specifically focused on production machine learning tools. Um, so basically, you know, just the explainability piece has, you know, an insane amount of open source libraries. Um, but the ones that we're going to be diving to today, uh, not saying that, you know, they're not, they, the rest are not as important for sure, but it's the ones that uh, I myself work uh, mostly on a day to day basis are uh, orchestration, explainability, and reproducibility. And for each of these principles, we're going to be diving into the conceptual definition of what they mean, together with an example, a hands on example, uh, show, showcasing what uh, uh, is the extent of uh, the ways that you can address this, this challenge. Uh, as well as a, a, a few shout outs to other libraries that are available for you to check out. <clears throat> so, to get started, model orchestration. Um, so, this is basically training and serving models at scale. And, you know, this is a challenging problem because you are really uh, 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 dealing with, uh, I guess, you know, in, in a very conceptual manner, uh, ha handling, you know, an operating system challenge at scale. Right, you need to allocate, allocate resource, <coughs> resources as well as computational uh, hardware requirements. For example, if you have a model that requires a GPU, then you need to make sure that the model executes in the area where the GPU is available. <coughs> so it is really hard. Uh, so it's important to make sure that you are aware that this complexity involves not just the skill set of the data scientists, but also it may require the, the sysadmins and infrastructure uh, expertise to be able to tackle it. And the, and the reason why it also gets hard is because having stuff in production that is dealing with real world problems, you know, also dives into other areas. So you have this already ambiguous, uh, uh, you know, role of machine learning engineering, and it, it's currently intersecting with the roles of, you know, industry domain expertise, as well as policy and regulation to create this sort of like centralized industry standards. Um, this already introduces that ambiguity of how do you have that compliance and governance with the models that you deploy in production. And, you know, this is kind of like the very, very high level, but, you know, for uh, some of the DevOps engineers, uh, they may say, well, the standardization of metrics, right? If you're in a large organization, you may actually have to abide by certain SLAs. And with microservices, these SLAs are quite standard. They are uptime, you know, they could be latency. Uh, but when it comes to machine learning, you may actually have some, some metrics that you have to abide by, like accuracy, uh, things that you need to be aware, like model divergence. And of course, you could actually put together the, the code required for every single one of your deployments. But you know, to a certain extent, it is necessary to be able to standardize and abstract these concepts on an infrastructural level. And that's what we're going to be diving into uh, in certain uh, level today. And it's not only metrics, you know, as you would know with any microservice or web app that you would, uh, you know, deal with in production, but it's also logs and errors, right? If you have an error with a machine learning model, the error may not just be a Python exception, right? This may be an error because the new training data uh, was potentially biased 
uh, towards a specific class, right? So you had a class imbalance with more examples in one class than in the other. That could be, in a way, leading to errors that are not specifically, you know, pi like exceptions, right? So you may not get notified because something failed, but you know, you may see stuff failing because of that. And it is also how do you standardize the stuff that comes in and out of the models? How do you uh, track this? And then also, for example, if you have if you have images coming into a model, uh, you know, you can't just go into your log, uh, uh, you know, Kibana dashboard and just see that like um, binary uh, dump of, of of the data, right? So it's it's really understanding what to log in 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 those cases. Now. When you actually deal with, with machine learning in production, you also dive into complex deployment strategies, right? So you, normally you may imagine just putting a, a uh, I don't know, um, text classifier in production, but perhaps you may want to reuse components. Or maybe you want a more complex computational graph uh, where you have some sort of like routing based on some conditional uh, uh, cases. You may have some you know, multi arm banded optimizations that may have different models at which they're having in, at the end, or you may have other things like explanations. Right now, you know, we're going to dive into that, but explanations are, are, are a big thing in the machine learning space, and you may want to have those things in, in production so that your uh, um, um, domain experts can make sense of what's currently deployed. And again, you know, yes, you could actually do this custom for every single thing, but the reason why you wouldn't want to do that is because if you, if you have a, a, a manual work with every single model, what you're going to end up having is um, you know, each data scientist having a maximum of, say, for example, 10 models that they can maintain in production um, at one possible time. So if you want to deploy more models, you're going to end up having to hire more staff. Right? So you actually want to avoid that linear growth uh, of your resources, technical resources, with your, with your actual internal staff. Uh, okay, and, and, and this is where you know, the concept of GitOps comes in. And this is, this is um, the concept of you define, uh, your, you, you use your, your, your GitHub repo or your version control system as your single uh, source of truth. And whatever actually gets updated there will reflect what you have in production. This may not be only limited to the code of your application, but may also you know, reach the extent of c the configuration in which your cluster may, may actually be uh, uh, currently following. Um, and in this case, you know, we're going to be showing an example um, where we are going to first start with a very, very simple model. We're going to be taking a you know, very common data set that you're probably used and followed a tutorial with, which is the income classification data set. And we're going to basically assume that you know, we're taking this you know, data set of, of um, you know, people's details, like you know, your uh, number of working hours per day, your um, you know, working class, et cetera, et cetera. And we're going to train a machine learning model to predict whether that person earns more or less than 50K. And in essence, in this example, we're going to assume that we're using these metrics for uh, approving, uh, approving someone's loan, right? If you get more than, uh, you know, if, if it predicts more than 50K, it would be approved, otherwise rejected. You know, I don't recommend anyone to do this uh, in production. This is just an example. Um, and what we're going to be doing is we're going to be wrapping this, this Python model and then deploying it uh, and, you know, seeing how we can get some of this, like, standardized uh, metrics, getting some of this standardized logging, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so in this case, um, all of these examples are actually uh, open source, and they're all available on, on the link. So you can actually go and try them yourself. Within an hour, I mean, we're only going to be able to cover them in a, in a, in a high-level perspective. So in, the, in this first part of the, of the, of the um, example, we're only going to be creating a, a Python model, then we're going to be wrapping it, and then we're going to be deploying it in a Kubernetes cluster. Right, so it's going to be containerized with Docker, and then it's going to be exposing uh, the internal functionality through a RESTful API. So the way that we would uh, do it is we would set up our environment, which basically requires you to have a Kubernetes cluster running. Um, you know, I'm not going to be trusting the internet for 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 that to actually help us today. So, uh, uh, you know, I already have everything set up in tabs, as you can see, just in case. Um, so what we're going to be doing in, in this case, we're downloading in, in, in here the data set. So this data set contains, um, you know, the, 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 in this case, applications of people uh, and whether they get approved or rejected. Uh, we do a train test split as you would normally would. 
Uh, and in this case, you know, you would have, uh, let's actually have a look at the data set. Oops, I'll just print it. Yeah, so you basically have already a normalized uh, uh, um, data set where you have in the first row the age of the people uh, and then uh, uh, remaining uh, classes for the rest of the of the features. Uh, and then we actually can, can print the labels as well. So I think I have them here. Oh, feature names actually. Uh, we can see the feature names, and that's basically the order in which we have them. So that's the age, the working class, education, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, perfect. So the first thing that we're going to be doing, we're going to be using scikit-learn. Um, so just to get a bit of a, an understanding, I mean, who here has used scikit-learn? Let's see a show of hands just for tutorial. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Um, so, so what we're doing here is we're just building a, a pipeline. We're going to be uh, uh, scaling uh, our, our, our uh, numeric data points as well as uh, you know, creating a one-hot encoding of our categorical uh, data points, uh, and we're going to be transforming the data with that. So now that we've actually, you know, fit uh, our preprocessor, uh, we're going to be then training a random forest classifier uh, with that sort of data set, um, so that it, you know, takes the uh, preprocessed data and then predicts whether that, uh, you know, a person would be able to get a loan approved or rejected. Uh, once we actually train our model, we can use the, the test data set to see how it performs. You know, we can see that in terms of accuracy, it has about, uh, you know, 85%, uh, you know, precision, recall, etc. cetera. Um, so now we have a trained model, right? We have, uh, with our scikit-learn, you know, CLF is our random force classifier, preprocessor is uh, basically our, our pipeline of our, our standard scaler and the one hot vectorizer. So then what, what we're going to do is we're going to actually take this model and containerize it. And what we're going to do for this is we're going to first just dump those two models that we've created. So for that, you know, preprocessor and uh, classifier. So we're dumping them in this, in this folder. Um, and, you know, we can actually see the, the, the contents. So let's... So we can see that we basically dumped it there. Uh, once we have those two uh, models that have been already trained, uh, we basically create a wrapper, and this wrapper is just going to have a predict function that will take whatever input comes in. Um, you know, this predict function is exposed, is, will be exposed through a RESTful API, but basically whatever input, we pass it through the preprocessor, and we pass it through the classifier, and then we return the predicted, uh, um, the prediction. Right, so this is, this is very simple, right? So we, we load the models, and then we just uh, run whatever is passed through this predict function uh, and return the predictions, right? Super simple. This wrapper is basically the interface that, that we just require so that we can actually containerize it. So for the next one, uh, uh, for the containerization, we just need to define any sort of dependencies. So in this case, we use scikit-learn uh, and the image because we're actually... Um, going to be sending, uh, well, in this case, we actually don't need the image, just scikit-learn. Um, and then we actually just define, you know, the name of our file, and we run the basically S2I uh, uh, CLI uh, tool that basically what it does, it takes our, our image, uh, our standard image um, that exposes and wraps this model file through a RESTful API and gRPC API, right? So once we actually have this container, so just to get a bit of an understanding in the room, uh, who here has used Docker before? Perfect. So here you just have, oh, great, awesome. So, so here you basically just have a Docker image called Lone Classifier 0.1. Uh, this Docker image, when you run it, the input command is basically just going to run a Flask API that exposes the predict function. Whatever you send to that predict, uh, to that, uh, predict endpoint you know, will be passed through basically, you know, your wrapper. So that, that is basically what it, what it would be doing. Right, so once we have that, we would just, uh, you know, specify it in our Kubernetes uh, definition file. So this is, you know, just saying, like, the container that we're going to have is this long classifier, and your computational graph, in this case, just has one element, which is the, the long classifier, and that's all, basically, you, you would have. Uh, once you define that, uh, if it's built, now you can actually deploy it. Uh, here you can actually see that it's being created in a local Kubernetes cluster. Um, so I think it is downloading it, which is not great. 
Um, but basically what you would uh, then see is this model is now deployed in our Kubernetes cluster. Uh, it's going to be listening uh, to any requests. Uh, so it's basically as if it was a uh, microservice, right? And then as any other RESTful endpoint, we can actually interact with it, in this case with curl. So in this case, we're actually just sending it um, you know, one, inst uh, one instance to actually perform an inference. You know, the response is an in the array of you know, the positive and negative label. In this case, it predicted you know, a, a negative label. So in this case, what we've done is we've actually wrapped a model uh, with a you know, very, very simple thin layer wrapper, put it in production. Um, the wrapper itself also exposes a metrics endpoint, uh, which for the people that have used Prometheus or Grafana in the past, uh, you know, Prometheus, you can actually hook it up to this metrics endpoint, um, and you're able to get uh, some metrics out of the box. Uh, in this case, uh, let's see if I can actually show it. Here is basically our income classifier that we have deployed. Um, and out of the box, you get, you know, in this case, this is a Grafana dashboard. Uh, you would get basically all of the requests per second. You get, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, latency for that specific uh, container, et cetera, et cetera. And we're actually going to be diving uh, a bit more into some of the metrics uh, in a bit. You also get some of the um, logs. So again, this is basically um, just the output of the container. It's just being collected with a, a, a Fluent D uh, a, a server and then you know, stored in an, an Elasticsearch database. So for the ones that have used Kibana in the past, this is just basically also us querying the Elasticsearch uh, for uh, the, the logs. And um, for tabular data is basically what uh, you know, we actually expose out of the box. Um, but basically, that is an initial overview of um, you know, the orchestration piece. Um, the benefits of actually you know, containerizing your models, of course, it's obvious in terms of like making it available for business consumption. But the core thing from this is the push towards standardization. Right? Is if you were to have you know, 100 uh, models in production, you would be able to interact with them as if they were microservices. Right? And what this allows you to do, you know, we, we have just covered a very, very simple example, but what this really allows you to do is to leverage this GitOps uh, uh, structure that I was talking about earlier. And um, just to see here, who here is familiar with uh, PyTorch uh, and with PyTorch Hub? Okay, so PyTorch Hub is basically a new initiative from PyTorch where they encouraged uh, uh, people to um, save trained models like BERT or VGG, where you can actually submit your models to a Git repo. And what that allows you to do is to have a, a, a central sort of like a, a, a standardized interface towards uh, your already trained models. So in this case, basically, you're able to define any model, in this case is ResNet, and you say this is how you load it, and this is where the trained binary is located. So it's an initiative from PyTorch Hub. And what we have been able to do is to actually create an integration to PyTorch Hub where any time that you actually point a, a new sort of like configuration deployment towards a repo, what it would do is very, a very thin layer wrapper that just downloads that model, right? Because the actual code um, to, to load it is standardized by the actual deployment. And you know, to be more specific, the way that we actually do it is you know, a, a wrapper where you basically take the repo and the name as input parameters that you can pass through the config files. And then when it actually loads, it downloads the model from PyTorch Hub, right? So you basically have a new, uh, an ability to dynamically publish, you know, any sort of like BERT or VGG-like models. I mean, anyone who has actually like tried using BERT or one of those, you know, state-of-the-art models would know the pain of, you know, often setting them up. So there's a lot of benefit of actually trying to standardize the way not only to define them, but also to, to, to deploy them. Um, you know, and again, you can actually jump in and, and, and try uh, these examples. So that is basically a high-level overview on the orchestration part. Before we jump into the explain explainability piece, uh, some other libraries to watch. Uh, you know, one of them is mleap serving. So their approach is they actually have a single server that allows you to, to, to load standardized uh, uh, sort of like serialization of models. So if anyone is familiar with the ONNX uh, um, sort of uh, serializable definition of, of models, 
um, you know, you'd be able to have a, a, uh, a single model that, that loads uh, your trained uh, binaries and expose them through, again, an, an API. And then another one uh, that is also one to watch is Deep Detect, uh, which unifies behind a standardized API a lot of these Python-based models. Uh, and these are two of, of you know, a large number of, of, of libraries to check out. I definitely would uh, advise you to have a look at the entire list. Uh, it's quite extensive. All right, so, so uh, the second piece, oh, it should be actually explainability, so we're going to jump on that one. Uh, explainability, this tackles the problem of black box model and white box model situations, where you have a trained model that you want to understand why did, uh, why did the model predict whatever it predicted, right? And, you know, this, uh, the way that we tackle it um, requires the people uh, uh, tackling this issue to go beyond the algorithms. And the reason why is because this is not just an algorithmic challenge. It does take a lot of the domain expertise into account. You know, and the way that we actually emphasize this is that interpretability does not equal explainability. You may be able to interpret something, but that doesn't mean that you understand it. And of course, you know, in terms of like, you know, the English definition of those words, there is not that, that conceptual perspective in place, but we, we tend to push that sort of way of thinking about it because it's not just bringing the data scientist to address these challenges, it may require also the DevOps software engineer, but also the domain expert to be able to understand how the model is behaving. And we actually did a three and a half hour tutorial at the AI O'Reilly. Um, so each of these things, you know, we could actually dive into an insane amount of detail. Uh, but just for the sake of simplicity, today we're gonna go and do a, a high level cover uh, overview. Um, the standard process that we, we often uh, suggest to follow, it, it actually extends the, the existing um, data science workflow that we showed previously. And it adds three new steps, uh, which they're not really new, but they are you know, three steps that are explicitly uh, outlined for explainability. These are you know, data analysis, model evaluation, and production monitoring. Production monitoring being the one that we're going to dive into uh, today. In terms of data assessment, you would want to uh, explore things like class imbalances, you know, things whether you're, you're using protected features, um, you know, correlations within data, you know, perhaps removing a data point may not mean that, you know, you're, you, you are actually uh, removing 100% of uh, the, the input that is actually being brought by that, um, as well as data representability, right? This is how do you make sure that your training data is as close as possible to your, your production data. And this is, you know, a very well-known problem. The second one is model evaluation. You know, this is asking questions of what are the, te the techniques that you can use to evaluate your models, things like feature importance, whether you're using black box techniques or white box techniques, whether you're using local methods or global methods, um, you know, whether you can actually bring domain knowledge into your models. And this is, more, this is important because, you know, what, what, you, what, what, your, what your models are doing, they're learning hidden patterns in your data, but if you can actually give those patterns uh, up front as features or as, uh, you know, combinations of your initial features that leverage some of the domain expertise, uh, then you're able to actually have much more, much simpler models uh, doing the processing at the end, right? One of the use cases that we had is in, in automation uh, in NLP, so automation of, of document analysis. Uh, we, were, we, we actually were, have been able to leverage a lot of uh, the domain expertise of lawyers. Right, asking like meta learning questions of how do you know this answer is correct? Or what is the process that you go into finding an answer? Right, things like that allow you to actually build smarter uh, algorithms and not just in the machine learning models, but in the features as well. Um, and then the, more, the most important one is the production monitoring, right? Is how can you then reflect the constraints that you introduced in your experimentation and make sure that you can set those in production? Right? If, you, if you think that, that precision is the most important metric and that you, you, you should not have a, a set of uh, you know, false positives or, or, or false negatives, then you need to make sure that you're able to have something in production that allows you to enforce that and monitor that. Right? So evaluation of metrics, manual human review, you know, for not forgetting that you can leverage humans too. Right? Like that is also something that with machine learning you, you, you can definitely do. Um, and, and the cool thing about this is that, you know, with, with, the, with the push that we have into 
the Kubernetes world, we're able to convert this, this uh, deployment strategies uh, from just things like explainers into uh, design patterns. So instead of just having a you know, machine learning model in production, um, you can have deployment strategies where you may have another model that is deployed in production whose responsibility is to explain and you know, reverse engineer your initial model, right? And this, this may get into a little bit of inception, but this is actually a pattern that has been seen quite effective and a lot of organizations are starting to adopt, uh, uh, which we named the explainer pattern, um, which is not very original, but this is what we're gonna be doing now. We're going to be, uh, we have already our model deployed in production. We're saying that this model is, is predicting uh, uh, whether someone's loan should be approved or rejected. And assuming that this is a black box model, we're now gonna deploy an explainer that is going to explain why our first model is behaving as it is, right? So that's what we're gonna be doing now. And we're gonna be using uh, that same example that we were leveraging. So now we, we have our, our, our initial model in production. We can actually reach it through this, through this URL. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna actually leverage um, this explainability library for which there are actually many of, um, but this is one that we maintain. Uh, it's called Alibi, and it offers basically uh, three main approaches to black box model predictions. Sorry, black box model explanations. The first one is anchors. And anchors, it answers the question of, from the features that, that you sent to your model for inference, what are the features that influence that prediction the most? Right, and the way that it does it is by actually not, like going through all the features and replacing a feature for a neutral uh, value and then seeing which one affects the, the output the most, right? So this is Anchor, and this is what we're actually going to be using. But there's another very interesting one called um, you know, counterfactuals. And co counterfactuals are basically the opposite, well, not, not really the opposite, but conceptually is the opposite of anchors. It asks the question of what is the minimum changes that I can, get, that I can, that I can add to this input to make that prediction incorrect, or at least different to what it was. Right, so if you were actually you know, approving someone's loan, the question would be, what are the changes that you can make to that input so that the loan is rejected, right? So this, this basically allows you to understand things like, for example, with, with uh, MNIST, you can ask questions of, well, what are the minimum changes that you can do to make that four not a four? But more, more interestingly, you can actually go from one class to another. You can say, what are the minimum changes that I can do to this four to make it a nine? Right? Um, so what we're going to be doing is, is first anchors on our, on our data set. Um, so, uh, well, in here we're actually just using uh, our Seldon client to also get the prediction. So we're, we're literally just sending a, uh, a request. And you know, this is the response, which is the same as their curl. Uh, but yeah, so we're going to create an explainer. And we're going to be using uh, Alibi and the anchor tabular explainer. So for this, what we're going to be doing is we're, we're going to take our classifier, so that classifier that we trained, that random forest predictor that we trained before, and we're going to actually expose that, the, the, the predict function, and we're going to feed that into our anchor tabular, right? Because it's going to be interacting with the model as if it was a black box model. It's only going to be interacting with the inputs and outputs. when using text or uh, uh, image, only when using tabular. Uh, the reason why is because with tabular, you need to ask the question of what, what, what would be the neutral numbers that you would use to replace, right? And in this case, for numeric data sets, you have to get the minimum and the maximum, and then you say, well, I want it to be the, 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 the quartiles or something like that. That's the only reason why you would use the, the training data. Uh, but yeah, so you would fit it, and then you would actually you know, uh, see what is the, 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 the um, inputs that we're gonna be sending. Um, you know, we are actually sending this one, you know, somebody of age 27, and we're gonna, you know, which is predicted as negative, and we're gonna actually explain it, and it basically says, well, what makes this prediction what it was is the feature marital status of separated and gender of female, right? So that's what basically uh, your explanation for this instance is. And what is now starting to get interesting is that we're now going to actually use our local explainer 
on our model that we basically deployed uh, 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 already, right? So in this case, that predict function uh, that we basically had, we're now going to be um, you know, using sort of like that remote model. So we're actually going to be sending the, 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 the request to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, um, uh, to the model that is currently in our Kubernetes cluster. And when we actually you know, request the explanation, we, we're going to get the same thing, right? The only difference is that we're now actually reaching to that model in production. And now we're going to actually follow the same things. We're going to just containerize the explainer, and we're going to put the explainer in, 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 in production, right? So you know, again, we actually create a wrapper. The wrapper has a predict function. The predict function just basically takes the, the, the input and you know, runs explain and returns the explanation, right? So now what we have in production, so we've, we've containerized, uh, we, we deploy it, and now what we have in production is now you know, an explainer. So we have you know, our loan classifier explainer as well as you know, our uh, uh, initial model. So what this is interesting is that now you can actually send to one of these com components a request to do an inference, and you can send another request to explain that inference by interacting with that model in production. And we can actually visualize it here. If you remember, <clears throat> with our income classifier, if we actually have a look at the uh, logs, these are all the predictions that have gone through uh, the, the, the model, uh, uh, through, through, through basically as, as, as um, uh, uh, requests. So what we can do now is we can actually take one of these and <clears throat> send a request for the, 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 the explainer to explain what's going on. And, and look, this is the exact same thing that you just saw in the other one, but just flashy, shiny, and colorful, right? Like this just basically says, <clears throat> for that other explanation, uh, you still have that you know, marital status of separated, influence your prediction by this much, uh, you know, gender female by this much, and you know, capital gain uh, by this much, and then you, you also can see you know, predictions that are similar or different. Um, but in essence, you know, you're still getting the same uh, 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 insights as if you're, you were using it locally, but again, you're getting that, those sort of standardized metrics. So that explainer also has the metrics exposed, also has the logs exposed, et cetera, et cetera. So you get that benefit. And that's basically um, the, the sort of like example to, to, the, to the explainers. And now we're actually gonna go one, one, one level deeper. Uh, but before that, I wanna give some, some uh, libraries to watch in the, exp in the model explanation world. These are EL, uh, LE5, which is Explain Like I'm 5. Uh, this is a very cool project. Uh, they do a lot of uh, different techniques. Uh, SHAP, which you've probably come across uh, if, you, if you are in this space or, or have uh, looked at uh, uh, model explanations. And XAI is one that we released specifically focused on, on data, so techniques for class imbalance, et cetera, et cetera. And then again, you know, as I mentioned, there's tons, right? I mean. With this uh, 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 black box model explanations, you know you can actually dive into so many different libraries. It's a very exciting field, uh, so I do recommend to actually have a look. Now, for the last part, uh, for the last part is on reproducibility. So, reproducibility this basically answers the question of how do you keep uh, the state of your model uh, with the full lineage of data as well as components, and this really breaks down into the abstraction of its constituent steps. For every single part of your machine learning pipeline, you're going to have a piece of code, configuration, input data, right? And for each of those uh, things that you have, you may want to actually uh, uh, freeze that as an atomic step. And the reason you may want to do that is because you may want to perhaps you know, debug something in production or for compliance have audit trails of what happened, when it happened, and what did you have in there. And the reason why it's also hard is because it's not only the challenge on an individual step. The challenge also goes onto your you know, entire pipeline, right? So each of the components on your pipeline, each of those reusable components may actually require to have that level of standardization. And you saw it with the, with the configuration definition that we had in the previous example, where we actually ha had a graph definition. Right? There you can have multiple different components, which are Docker containers, which are containerized pieces of your atomic steps. And one thing is to actually be able to keep those atomic steps, and another one is to actually be able to keep the understanding of the metadata of the artifacts that are within each of these steps. Right? Because metadata management is hard. Right? 
and now we're getting into a point where it's not only metadata management, but it's metadata management on machine learning at scale. And you know, it's doable, it's just that it requires to sort some areas uh, uh, you know, a new way of thinking. And what we're gonna be diving into here is basically the point that we haven't covered. We talked about models that are already trained, but what we haven't talked about is potentially the process of training models. And we're actually currently contributors to this project called Kubeflow, um, which I'm not sure if you've heard about, but it, Kubeflow focuses on uh, training and experimentation of models uh, on Kubernetes. And what it allows you to do is to actually build reusable components. Uh, what we're gonna be diving into in this last example is going to be a reusable NLP pipeline in Kubeflow. And uh, what this is going to be more specifically, uh, let me actually open it, uh, is going to be uh, this example, which I, I have the, uh, the Jupyter Notebook. Um, you can try it yourselves, but we're going to be actually uh, creating a pipeline with these individual components. If you guys have ever done NLP tasks, we're going to be doing a, let's call it sentiment analysis, uh, where you would find the usual steps, cleaning the text, uh, tokenizing it, vectorizing it, and then running it through a logistic regression classifier, right? The first step is just gonna download the data. And we're, we're basically using the Reddit hate speech data set. So from our science, all the comments that were deleted from mods, you know, they've been compiled. Um, and yeah, so basically what we have here is this components, we would want to actually create this computational graph in production um, that uses them as separate entities. And the reason why you want that is because maybe you want to reuse your spacey tokenizer for different other projects. Um, uh, and you want to keep perhaps your, uh, you know, holy uh, met, uh, feature store, right? Where you actually just pick and choose uh, different things. You know, that ultimate drag and drop data science uh, uh, world. Um, but, but yeah, so, so basically this is what we're gonna be doing in this, in this uh, uh, example. Um, you know, from a high level perspective, what it's gonna consist of is five um, uh, repeats of wrapping models. Uh, but in this case, it's just wrapping uh, uh, scripts uh, in that same process that we did previously. Uh, for example, the clean text uh, step is basically, again, just a, a, a wrapper called transformer with a predict function that takes you know, the, the text as a NumPy array. Uh, it runs the vectorization of that. Uh, um, oh, in this case, is the, the actual TFIDF vectorizer. It runs the vectorization and then returns uh, the actual um, uh, 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 vectorized output, right? And then in terms of the actual interface to it, it's just like a, a CLI. But once we have these components, then you know, we're able to define our, our pipeline, and we can upload this pipeline into Kubeflow, which then looks like this, right? It's basically all of the steps which all the, with, with all the dependencies. The, the only difference is that um, it uses a volume, um, that is attached to each of the components to pass the data from one container to the other, right? So for each component, the, the volume is attached. And the interesting thing here is that you can actually create uh, the, the, the sort of like experiments through your front end. You know, you can actually choose what parameters you expose. Uh, and, you know, here I can actually change the number of TFIDF features, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and then just run uh, uh, our, our pipeline. Uh, and then you can actually see your, your experiments, you can see which ones have run, uh, and then for each of the, of the steps, you can actually see uh, the input and output as you print it uh, for each of the, of the components. So here we can see the text coming in, and then the tokens uh, coming out uh, from, from the other side. Uh, and then the last step, you know, it, 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 it's a deploy, uh, and what that basically does, it just puts it again in, in, in production, listening through any requests, uh, for this specific uh, demo, what we've done is, uh, you know, you can see the deployed model here. So it's an NLP Kubeflow pipeline. Um, and, you know, you can see that there's actually live requests through each of the components. So you can see that the clean text, uh, the spacey tokenizer, the vectorizer, et cetera. What we're sending it live, and this is actually quite funny, we're actually sending all the tweets related to Brexit. Uh, do you guys know what Brexit is? Yeah? <laughs> so it's actually doing hate speech classification 
So the funny thing is that doesn't matter what side you're in, there's a lot of hate. Um, and uh, we can actually see, uh, uh, you know, here we, we, we have the sort of like nice looking logs, but, you know, as I mentioned, you can also jump into the Kibana, and here you can see like, you know, Celtic, Brexit, Spring, uh, yeah, well, I don't know, I don't want to read them out loud because there, there are some that, you know, are not very um, appropriate. Um, but yeah, so, so basically now we have just this, this like production, uh, uh, you know, Brexit classifier uh, that can actually be trained with different data sets and it's just exchanged automatically through, through this step. Um, and the objective here is to actually just show um, the, the, the sort of um, complexities of this reproducibility piece and how there are different tools trying to tackle it. This dives more into the experimentation and training part and I haven't even dived into the pieces around the complexity for tracking metrics as you run experiments, right? This is basically, I ran 10 iterations of the model. I want to know which performed better. How do I keep track of my metrics as well as the models that I used? So, you know, the, 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 each of these things that I've covered has so many different dimensions to tackle them from. Um, and, you know, we actually have talks online where we have, you know, an hour, an hour and a half of just one of these. You know, today was more of like a high level overview. And you know, other libraries to watch, you know, data version control, DVC, they're basically a Git-like uh, uh, sort of CLI that allows you to, um, um, you know, run the usual sort of like commit, push uh, uh, workflows, uh, but for that sort of like three components of your code, configuration, data, et cetera. And another one is MLflow from Databricks, and this focuses on actually experiment tracking. Uh, we actually have some, some examples where we integrate and Pachyderm, which dives into full compliance. So as you can see, you know, the ecosystem of this is, is so broad, uh, but it's also at the same time super, super interesting. Um, and yeah, so uh, uh, I'm going to wrap up and jump into questions, just in case anyone has uh, any questions on, on this or any other libraries. Uh, but before that, I'll just, uh, um, you know, give a few uh, words on this, on this sort of stuff. Um, you know, we covered, you know, three of the key uh, uh, areas that, you know, I have been focusing on. These are orchestration, explainability, uh, and reproducibility. But as I mentioned, you know, the content is, you know, insanely broad. Um, things that I actually haven't talked about, which is also insanely interesting, are things like uh, adversarial robustness. You know, as you saw, some of our ex explainability techniques have an approach to explain through adversarial attacks kind of. So it, it, it's also interesting to see how there is a lot of uh, overlap across each of these areas. Um, and, and also not only overlap, but also uh, different levels into which some fit in other of the categories, right? You know, privacy is one that is super interesting that, you know, we haven't covered that dives into privacy, uh, privacy preserving machine learning, uh, um, which is a, a, an interesting area in itself. Storage, serialization, function as a service, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, with that, uh, uh, you know, I have been able to give a high-level overview of the state of production machine learning in 2019. Uh, it wasn't exhaustive, but you know, it does feel like it was. Um, but yeah, so if we have some uh, um, questions, I'm happy to cover them now or later at the pub. Uh, thank you very much, guys. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for your talk. I'm actually chairing your session. So do we have questions? Please come ahead, come to the microphones. Uh, it's working. Um, for your questions, please. Hi, excellent talk, thank you. I was mostly inspired by this explainability idea and uh, have two questions about it. So first, uh, let's uh, assume we have a lot of features and they have, uh, like, uh, uh, they produce uh, a um, huge space of variance uh, mm. that can be, uh, like, a huge space of variance. So mm -hmm. it seems that uh, when I try to uh, explain this black box, I need to uh, iterate all, all, all these features, all variants of these features, and it seems like performance issue here. Uh, how can it be solved and, uh, yeah. So that, that's the first question, was, was the second one? And I'll repeat it. Repeat uh, it. Oh, okay, it was first. Yeah, yeah. and uh, the, sec the second one, that uh, some models um, uh, itself uh, uh, um, 
has some information about feature important, importance uh, within it, yeah, like uh, this random uh, forest. Mm -hmm. uh, have you compared um, some uh, results from this explainer uh, with internal results of uh, the model itself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, no, that's, that's, that's two really good questions. So the first one was uh, basically, you know, you have a lot of features, what's the computational complexity around that and how you deal with that. The second one is basically uh, on, uh, um, what, what, what was the second one? The second question was? About internal importance. Internal importance, yeah, comparing internal importance to, to the black box model explainability. So yeah, yeah, okay, so let's dive first into, into the, the computational uh, uh, challenges. So that is 100% that is correct. And in terms of anchors as, as a technique, um, you know, we are conscious that uh, in order for you to explain uh, black box models as a whole, um, it often uh, becomes quite expensive. Um, the way that we have been able to tackle it is by separating uh, the way that you actually request uh, explanations and predictions. So for explanations, you may not want something that is like real time and for every single one of the, the, the predictions that go through but instead is for actually di diving deeper into one or, or a few of the inference uh, predictions that you may have, right? So perhaps if something went wrong, you can use explanations to uh, debug uh, how, it, how it performed, or if you know, the threshold that you set for uh, accuracy was 90%, uh, you, know, you would only request explanations for things that fall under when you assess them. Um, so, so, so that is from one side. In the other, uh, Interestingly enough, this week, our data science team just published a paper that actually proposes a way to, to deal with um, uh, the computational challenges with counterfactuals specifically and with contrastive explanations. And that is basically uh, uh, using uh, 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 prototypes, the concept of prototypes. Uh, and this is with uh, um, uh, uh, sort of like neural networks to reduce the dimensionality of your features themselves. Um, so, so uh, you know, that paper's an archive and you can check it out, but there is a lot of research in that space to actually make it more feasible uh, without sacrificing the, the power on explanations. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's no silver bullet, so, uh, you know, I, I do acknowledge that, that, that it is a challenge, um, but then that is why there's the benefit of also leveraging white box model predictions uh, in certain situations where you actually can uh, and falling to your second question, you can actually leverage some of the internal structures of the models, like random forests or neural networks, you know, uh, using sort of like the weights of the networks to actually explain uh, much easier. It's also worth mentioning that the explanations themselves, the explainers, some of them, they're optimization problems. So for example, we use gradient descent to find uh, uh, some of the, the explanation techniques for uh, the counterfactuals. Uh, now, for, for uh, the second piece, in terms of leveraging the internal stuff and also seeing how it performs against the black box models, so we actually haven't done uh, benchmarks of how it performs against, uh, but that's definitely something that we would be interested on. If you're interested on that, you know, Adobe is open source, so we would love uh, a pull request or an issue to our documentation on that. Um, but that's, that's a really good question. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Do we have more questions? Please go ahead. Hello, uh, I have two questions. First is, uh, what are your views about setting up a kind of a feedback loop, a pipeline for feedback loops, uh, saying that after your model has gone into production and you have a result at the end of the day saying that, hey, you know what, for these, 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 you had the correct predictions and for these uh, number of records you had uh, wrong predictions. How do you go about get training that retraining or incrementally retraining your model after it has gone out into production? Yeah, that, that, that is an excellent question. And, and you know, one of the, that, that was one of the key things that I actually discussed in, I guess they call it three, three hour workshop. I call it three hour rant um, because I was trying to push how important that, that piece is. And unfortunately, again, there's no silver bullet in terms of, you know, you can't just deploy a model and have that feedback loop out of the box because not always you actually have data that is relabeled in production. Right, I'll give you a, a, a specific exam example. If you're doing automation of support tickets, routing, then at the end, the support tickets will be resolved at some point, right? So you're actually getting data that is being labeled in real time. So you could actually get that feedback uh, real time. Other times where actually labeling of data is so expensive, 
you may not have that benefit, but you may still want to have that specific feedback loop. And in that term, you may actually require to establish that manually. And what that would mean, say, would require every month or every week or every year, once a year, to evaluate the performance of the model by having a set of random data, you know, perhaps uh, you know, uh, uh, on, a, on a balanced set of classes uh, that is labeled by hand and then compared to what it should be and to see the performance. Um, so so that, that feedback loop should definitely be in place. The way that it should be installed is different depending on the use cases. Um, there is also that sort of other part, which is not feedback loop in terms of performance, but it could be just feedback of real time uh, performance of the metrics. And actually for, for one of the, the things that I, that I mentioned in the, uh, I think it was orchestration, is um, you, know, you, may, you may have like three different models that in real time you may want to optimize the routing, that's also other type of feedback. So in the API, in the SDK that we build, we actually have an endpoint called feedback that, you, that allows you to actually send uh, you know, stuff back. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the word feedback can mean so many things, but on those two specific ones, that would be my thought. Yeah. Uh, and just one thing more, uh, you mentioned about production monitoring. Yeah. Uh, and when you said that a uh, data scientist has to maintain a certain number of models in production, uh, what, what would actually trigger uh, manual action on that particular model? What are the KPIs that you actually, yeah, uh, the prediction accuracy is one of them, but what actually would trigger that, yes, there's something wrong with the model and the data scientist needs to actually go and evaluate that model from the ground up? Mm -hmm. So I, th I think it's, it's not as explicit as, you know, the, time, the manual time is because uh, things go wrong. It, the manual time, it actually goes all the way from the, the moment the data scientist goes like, my model is ready, I want to put it in production for business consumption. From that moment, the, 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 the data scientist has to think, well, maybe I need to uh, expose a RESTful API. So he needs to write, he or she needs to write the code to actually you know, wrap it on a Flask server. Uh, then it needs to expose the endpoints because the endpoints are quite custom and are not standardized across all other models that other data scientists you know, put in production. You know, he, uh, he or she needs to actually like, assess how it's performing. Uh, if something goes wrong, uh, you know, the data scientist needs to jump in and, and assess why it went wrong. If it needs to be retrained, again, data scientist needs to retrain it. So it's a lot of little things that require that manual, not just input, but also continuous thinking around that because the responsibility of that model beyond it's ready, is, it still falls within the data scientist. So it's just, be, it's just pushing it towards that. Once a model is done, it, it should become similar to microservices to a certain extent because you know, as a software engineer, you still have to jump in and debug it. But to a certain extent, once the model is ready, it becomes a sysadmin or DevOps challenge. right? So then you can have hundreds under the same metrics so it's not just individual people assessing their own things in production. And you have the same thing with, with uh, software engineering when you deploy microservices, you want to avoid that and standardize it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. We have two minutes left for questions. Do we have more questions for our speaker today? Hmm? Yes. Uh, do you have um, generic components to uh, ensure that the confidence levels that are outputted by the models are calibrated in one way or another? Um, so we don't, we, don't, we don't have a standardized sort of metric per se, but you are able to expose custom metrics. Mm -hmm. uh, what is standardized is the way that these metrics are co collected. So they're collected through Prometheus. Well, they're, they're exposed through a metrics endpoint that then can be collected through Prometheus and then you know, consumed by Grafana. Then it's very easy to set uh, thresholds to get notified. So it is possible to just set thresholds for you know, any of that standardized accuracy metric. But then again, when you say 90% accuracy, that may vary from use case to use case. And also accuracy is often uh, irrelevant because sometimes you know, a false positive may have more influence than a false negative. So what we try to standardize is the metrics that come out and the way that they can be evaluated as opposed to the metrics that should be uh, evaluated, if that if that makes sense. Yeah, 
Um, my question was more specifically on, uh, for instance, if you do classification uh, as the example that you gave, mm -hmm. uh, y y the model can output, uh, I'm confident that it's 80% chance uh, negative, oh. uh, but maybe uh, it's actually not, uh, um, like uh, if you take uh, out of 100 uh, predictions and you've been the predictions by the confidence level, you could see that the, the fraction of uh, negatives in each bin are not actually reflected uh, the, uh, the, the, true, the confidence levels outputted by the model. And uh, depending on the models that you do, you might have different calibration issues. And uh, I was wondering if calibration is something that is uh, like a generic tool that you could put in your pipeline and uh, is something that is requested by the users or how to leverage the, the calibration and or maybe uh, it's not addressed yet, and that's it. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I think definitely calibration is, is one of the, the uh, important things. I mean, we do have some open source work um, that exposes not only the things like the multi-arm bandit, but also techniques for things like outlier detection that you can use. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have like a generic piece, mm -hmm. but that, that is not because there's no demand. It's just because we, we don't have enough hands. Okay. Uh, so we'd love that. Again, you know, it, it's open source, you know, open an issue if we get enough uh, you know, thumbs up, then, you know, we definitely prioritize it. Um, and we actually have a bunch of examples. We'd love to have just another Jupyter notebook example showcasing how you would do that. Um, but that is, a, that is definitely a good point and it's a very, very interesting area uh, in, in this space, yeah. Awesome, thank you. We have time maybe for one last. Okay, if we don't have any further questions, let's have a very warm applause for Alejandro for his talk. Thank you.